delighted to be joined by Darren Rook. Hi, Darren. How are you? Hey. <laughs> I'm good. How are you doing? I'm very good. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, I'm, you're someone that I've been wanting to speak to for, for quite a long time. Um, now, of course, you were the, the founder or the co-founder of London Distillery Company and the head distiller as well. So uh, a, a company that I've been quite fascinated yeah. with and been trying to get hold of uh, some of the releases for, for, for quite a while now. And um, it's had a bit of a kind of turbulent history, the London Distillery Company, which I'm sure we'll uh, have a little chat about in a moment. Yeah. But perhaps let's go back to the start and, and uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you became a distiller and how that then led on to becoming the London Distillery Company. Yeah, so so not to make this too long, because I know, you know, we were looking at about 10, 15 minutes to chat. Yeah. The, um, it, you know, my experience is originally working for Glen Morangy at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. So I, I say that back in the day, I was a bar manager and, and I, I set up a whiskey bar in Newcastle in the northeast of England. Okay. Um, and I was running movie nights and doing whiskey. So we we started out with like, 10 15 whiskeys and we used the ticket sales to buy buy liquid now this is in like 2006 so by the time a year had passed and we were doing these movies and you know like just cruise we do like japanese whiskey with lost in translation for example yeah so for that night off the proceeds of the tickets it was fully sold out we ended up buying like oh what was it like 15 different Japanese whiskeys. Now, 2006, can you imagine a whiskey bar having 15 Japanese whiskeys? It was okay. crazy. And then we'd have like a full range of Ardbeg and all this different stuff. We did like, um, we just did loads of fun movies every month and we'd have people come in and we kind of built this whiskey club. So I got a start there, um, met my wife at the time who was Canadian and um, moved to Canada and was kind of in Canada and a bit of limbo do I want to stay here I want to get involved in whiskey and, and found out a job that came up with the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society that was owned by Glen Morangy at the time so mm -hmm. I actually moved back to Scotland started working for those guys in a kind of like bar management brand ambassadorial role so I'd be sent out to do whiskey tastings at different places I ended up managing the London venue for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society um and managing the kind of tasting team and doing tastings as well and and then um and then the guys from master of malt so justin and ben and tom um back in the day when master of malt was kind of grown said we'd love you to join the team we love what you're doing here in london and what you're doing you know with the scotch malt whiskey society your enthusiasm for everything mm -hmm. and at that point, as I was just joining Master of Malt, I met this guy called Nick Taylor, who was a member of the society. And he said to me, hey, why isn't there any whiskey distilleries in London? Um, he'd actually asked that question a week earlier to, to Joel Harrison, um, the, the writer and his business partner, Neil Rid Ridley. And I knew Neil and Joel really well. So they they had kind of said, look, there's one guy you need to talk to if you want to know about London whiskey history, which is Darren at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society in oh, you know okay. Greville Street. Yeah. So so they sent them to see me and we sat down and we had a conversation about whiskey, um, about the old roots of whiskey in London, you know, the 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 just getting into simple stuff like Ushkaba and how like the Scottish spelling of whiskey with no E is different from the Irish and all that sort of stuff. But then, you know, like how there had been distilleries in London and there was this long um, background of it, you know, like William, um, what is it? Not William of Orange. When will, when, um, oh, what's his name? Harold. When Harold got that arrow oh, yes. in his eye in 1066. Yeah. So the records around that actually have, um, discussions around making barley based distilled spirit that was aged so in 1066 there was whiskey being made on the outskirts of london because the battle the battle of hastings um obviously yeah. was outside of london you know so like there's stuff like that that people just don't know like the english whiskey heritage is actually way older and when you think about 1066 what's the first record of scotch whiskey 1496 mm. um you it's know so, so 400 notice. years earlier <laughs> see the, the stuff like that we got into and i was like I, i'm kind of a passionate geek for for 
searching back. So basically, Nick turns around to me after this long, convoluted, whiskey-fed conversation. He's drinking whiskey. I'm behind the bar serving. And he said, do you want to do a whiskey distillery in London? And I, I was kind of like, well, I'd love to. And he said, no, I mean, like, do you want to do one with me in London? So <laughs> he worked in invest, investor relations. So he, he was basically like a guy who helped people get investment money. Yeah. So he was like, let's do this together. I'll help you find funding you know and and you set the business up so went out business planned it all um at that time neil and joel were actually involved to a certain extent but their whiskey cask um the cat the cask strength creative stuff was grown so they kind of took a big back step and then and then stepped out all together um you know and, and in recognition of how much they did at the start we actually gave them a small piece of equity just to say thank you um so they stayed involved in that way and then um me and Nick went out, we fundraised a small amount of money. We'd met this this um, guy who used to work for Barclays, who was a whiskey geek, and he put the first round up. And then we actually went out and crowdfunded the business. So this was 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. We launched on Crowdcube. Uh, we were one of the first 10 businesses globally to crowdfund. So a couple of months earlier, BrewDog had just finished their first crowdfunding round, the very first round in, in the equity for punks. And um and then we followed that shortly after. So you know, like it, that was amazing to be one of the first businesses to actually crowdfund globally. Um, one of the first ten wow. <laughs> globally. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was it was a big learning curve though. You know, like I was going through these huge learning curves. I'd been in business management. I'd worked through different companies doing management in the past, but I hadn't had any of that like entrepreneurial business stuff. So it was oh, a big, a big learning, it was a big learning shift. Yeah. yeah. So then so, we. You, Sorry, sorry, to drop there. So I was going to say, so a lot of firsts. So you were, you know, yeah. the first, well, one of the first kind of distilleries to, uh, or you, know, you mentioned Brewdog as well, but the yeah. first kind of company in London to, to go for the crowdfunding route, which is pretty yep. special, but also the first, yep. uh, the first London distillery to be making whiskey in over a hundred years. So was it Lee exactly, Valley? Wasn't yeah. it the last one? That uh, uh, Lee Valley was the last one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So pretty amazing. Then, um, so. And then yeah. how quickly, you know, how long did it take you to get the distillery set up and, and things up and running and before you were making your, your first spirits? So we, we closed the funding round with Crowdcube um, in the February, uh, March. By late March of 2012, this is, we, we'd found a location in Battersea, which was um, on Parkgate Road. It was the original site of the distillery. We'd worked out a lease deal for three years um, as a starter, just to, to to kind of work things out with our, our landlord there, and and then um, and we refurbished the space, which took about six months. Um, mm -hmm. We had the equipment built by Christian Karl um, in Germany at the time, and like during that time period of six months, got that all installed, and started making liquid by the December of. Well, let's just think about this. Yeah, it was like the December we did that first run of whiskey. Um, so it was single malt mm -hmm. and we were just using, for that run, we actually used a Marisada. So we had Marisada on an old Young's yeast strain. And we were using this guy called Chris, um, who has a business called Sure Brew. Mm -hmm. I think he's in West Sussex. He's either in East or West Sussex, but um, really amazing yeast lab. He would pull samples from, from the National Yeast Library. He, he'd go to breweries and he'd help them do quality control on their, their propagations. But then he would also pull small samples of different fun stuff. So he had this thing that he called orange esters, for example, which, um, and it's, it's in one of the casks in, in, I guess, the British Honey Company's warehousing now. But yeah. um, that orange ester yeast profile was from a closed down brewery from the early 1900s, uh, the early um, 1800s that oh, wow. Chris had swabbed from, from like going inside. And it literally, when it was fermenting, it, it smelled like Terry's chocolate orange. When, and oh, when wow. it distilled, you had this like crazy orangey profile that, that yeah, when we put in the cask, so he was so excited to see what happened. So, you know, like there's stuff like that where you've got like orange esters, the original yeast strain. And there's two, there's two um, yeast strains when, when you look at Young's. So there's like a, there's a, 
earlier version from from the late 1800s and then there's a version from like the mid 1900s so you know like I, I might have my info wrong on that but that's that's how I understood it um oh. there was a 1926 British distillers yeast strain that we were using and some other other bits as well which had you know I, I'm talking about yeast I think people don't realize the impact yeast has on flavor profile and yes casks and still shape and fermentation length and time have have that but also you know like actually selecting specific yeast have a yeah. has a big impact i know i know the guys at leaf distillery up in scotland in edinburgh are, are playing with it at the moment and they, yeah. so, they have so in, their, in the um in, in terms of like when you started whiskey production uh here in london being the first for you know over 100 years and now yeah. that there's there's a few other guys that are out making whiskey and they've got them released to yeah. market and that kind of thing so but really you guys the london distillery company were the, were the pioneers of, of english whiskey making to, or, or london whiskey making and and you mentioned well, there's two, you know, going out sorry i don't mean in the, i don't mean oh, to sure. interrupt you on this there's there's two sides to that though because you know I, i'm talking about like we we found this space and we applied for the licenses i i actually i completely forgot so we we started to still the whiskey in 2013 because yeah. we got the gin gin production licenses, you know, we're doing Dodds and Q. We got the gin production licenses straight away, not a problem. That's super easy. But whiskey licenses, historically, you know, there's this whole thing about like an 1800 litre still. If anyone's interested, you know, geek out on, on Scotch whiskey history. And there's this whole thing around like yeah. this 1800 litre still you couldn't put on the back of a horse and cart and drag it around. Yeah. Now, we with the help of a guy called Alan Powell, who's this amazing ex HMRC like licensing officer. Now he's like a lead advocate and he, he, you know, like he's the guy to go to if you need to know anything about this still. And Alan Powell for like legislative stuff. He works with the, the government on, on making changes and modernizing. He's really into trying to make it more accessible. Yeah. But um, Alan, helped us write to HMRC, pull all these precedents and, and actually battle to make it that anyone who wanted to do whiskey, as long as they could show it was commercially viable under the 1800 litre still size could do it. So we, we actually at London Distillery changed the law so that, you know, when you're talking about these new distilleries like Bimber or East London Liquor or, you know, like I think there's Dogtown or Dog, Dog House. House. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and like all those guys who are making whiskey, couldn't have done that without us and yeah. and not just in london across the whole country you know so whether it's like the guys up in york or whatever it is when your stills are less than 1800 liters mm -hmm. the, it was a blanket no like the english whiskey company didn't get their their licenses yeah. be, for for whiskey because of the smaller stills so they had to go up up a size they were originally going to do smaller stills that's the way i understand it yeah. and, and we we spent a year battling back and forward with with a licensing officer to get to get that pushed, we changed the law. Wow. Um, so it's quite it's quite so fascinating. We, 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 that yeah, it, there's so, <laughs> so many things that you guys were doing for the first time that have opened the doors for for that. Really, you, you know, the work that you put in has opened doors for lots of others yeah. that have followed you since kind of well, you say 2010, you set up, and back then yeah. there was probably just you know there's only a few guys that were set up. So you were amongst one of the first, and certainly the, the first in London. But one thing yeah. I, I noticed as well that. Um, and talking to you a little bit earlier, that you were started to do things for the first time as well in terms of the maturation. So, of course, in yeah. Scotland, there, there's certain, and I've talked about this in other bits about certain regulations that you have to follow and the certain wood types and things like that. So, yeah. you were using um, English oak um, for the That's first time. Right. Did you use yeah, yeah, Alistair yeah. Sims, the Cooper? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, Alistair, he made a cask for someone else, actually. He made two casks for someone else out of English oak. Um, that person had came to us and said, you know, like we've we've had these casks, we've intended to do a distillery for a long time. Alistair made them, would you be interested? So then we we bought those casks and they'd been sitting for three years. Um, so the casks, rather than being fresh oak, that had time. Um, because when we spoke to Alistair, he was going to use fresh wood. Um, because mm. you know, he was making them bespoke. So so the intention was always to have English oak casks yeah. and then blend in with a bit of American oak, um, but ultimately get to the point where we had our own Cooper and process and everything. Obviously, London Distillery never got to that point, um, but we had this like we would program that for every cask we planted, we were going to invest in English oak trees that then we could get, you know, we could get yeah. more, more wood down the line. 
So, so things were things were going really well for you guys. You know, you're the first London distillery to get the license. You, you know, paved yeah. the way for others. You're, you've got very successful uh, gin brands out there, Dodd's Gin. Um, you've got some yeah. other, you know, spirits that are on the market. Your whiskey yeah. is maturing nicely and soon to to, to, to to be released and come to market. And of course, there was a, a few sort of bumps in the road. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what happened around that? And I know. Um, there was a point when yeah. you, you had to leave the company and things like so how did things go from being very promising big expan expansion plans to um to, to sort of you leaving the company and that kind of thing yeah so I, i'll try and keep this brief for you because like i said I, I do like to talk <laughs> <laughs> and i think we're already at 15 minutes well, so well, the, I, you um, know i will just you know, say the... i find it fascinating and the only reason uh, actually one thing that people <laughs> watching this won't know is we we already spoke for pretty much an hour uh, beforehand and um i'm yeah. trying to think <laughs> the points that we spoke about yeah. and uh, it'd be there. so yeah so i don't want to interrupt you but i'm just trying to lead it That's a little right. bit long so i can to, to be honest it's all about me editing stuff i'm useless at editing and uh if I could have like a four hour video, I'd love to. Uh, I'm a bit of a geek. You would do it, yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to keep this succinct for you because I literally, there's like so much history that we could go into. It's crazy. Oh, but um, so, so yeah, basically, we opened the distillery, we start making whiskey. You know, we're doing, we have a year of running um from 2013 to 2014 where we're doing a couple of casks every, every month. And in 2014, my wife, then wife, had a brain tumor that we found out about. And that mm -hmm. kind of threw a huge curveball into the into my life. And, and yeah. it, it had an impact on the business because, you know, I was full time there. So for approximately six months, I, I ended up half time out the business. We kind of shut the whiskey production program down. Yeah. Um, and we actually brought someone in called Joe McGurr, who was an ex-colleague at Glenmorangie um, at the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. And he um, was a very good friend and I trusted him. So I said, look, I'm struggling here. I need some support. To... And he wanted to open his own distillery. So now he runs the Boatyard Distillery in, in Northern Ireland in Enniskillen and he owns it. You know, he set it up and and um, basically Joe came in and I... I me and him worked together and for the next year we um we kind of got the company back into black um because while i was away thing while i'd been working part-time things had kind of dropped down we you know we kind of um started to get to the point where whiskey production was going to kick back in and then our landlord turned around for the building we were in on parkgate road and and basically said we've sold it to a property developer everyone has to leave the building Gosh. And, yeah. and, you know, like, it's hard to describe business disruption Yeah. when, you know, when, when you have to move a whole whiskey distillery to a different place. My gosh. So, so you must have so a lot of we, things on your mind as well with all the things that have happened in yeah. your personal life with wife and well, things like that. And, and, and yeah. she was still recovering, you know, like yeah. she, she was still recovering. So like, you know, there was huge demands because I had two young children. So at that time, my kids um, were like, one and a half and three you know so i'm trying to like manage being at home more and being more more present but at the same time the business is like another baby and it's a startup so that's like you know like it's drawn me in a different direction as well so it was it was a really difficult time and you know like literally my my partner had nearly died like she she was mm. so close to dying it was it was pretty scary and i just hadn't i hadn't had any time to deal with that at that point um so like I'd literally gone from like dealing with someone nearly dying and the business kind of needing me as well to then going back into the business to then happen to move it to somewhere else. Yeah. So we basically found a location in Bermondsey on the opposite side of London. At the same time, I'd been running a conversation with Battersea Power Station for the expansion of the business into, into a railway arch down there. Um, yeah. You know, this is just a really quick aside. And, I, you know, I know time is, I don't want to run too far. But, no, but you know, when the, the original London Distillery Company, so I, I'd, I'd picked the name London Distillery, not realizing that there'd already been a London Distillery Company. And then when I was doing the due diligence with with a member of staff, a guy called Andrew McLeod Smith, he he's um with Sweet Dram in Edinburgh now. So he went off and set up his own distillery in Edinburgh. They do some really cool, creative, fun stuff. 
Um, mm-hmm. They used to have a lab. I think they've still got a lab in London, or maybe they've closed it and moved it. But they used to have a lab in Mile End where they do product development. But they okay. do some fun liquid. Um, but yeah, Andrew and me were going between the the British Library and the National Archives, and and we found this this record of the London Distillery from from eighteen um, eighteen twelve. And, and it was basically this guy called Ralph Dodd, who was from the northeast of England. He actually used to live in Bladen, which is my hometown. He okay. set up the London Distillery Company, and he'd been sent to London to study at the Royal College of um, Arts, which was right next to where we'd found the location in Battersea. So suddenly we have this like huge connection. But the, the original London Distillery site was at Battersea Power Station. We had the maps and everything, all the documents. I, I, I'll, I'll dig it out on my hard drive um, and I'll, I'll send you a Let's scan see, of it yeah, if yeah. I can find it. But yeah, so basically this guy, Ralph Dodd, who was from my hometown 200 years earlier, had built a distillery in Battersea and, and it just turned out it was at the Battersea Power Station. So we'd gone to Battersea Power Station and said, look, we, we do whiskey, which is what Ralph was originally doing in London. And we do gin and actually the, his gin distiller was a man called um john i want to say john taylor but i feel like that's wrong um mm-hmm. who was the who was actually the founder of the distillery that became the beef eater distillery because the beef eater mm-hmm. owner bought up an existing distillery um yeah. from a family and used their recipe so the original beef eater um like liquid developed brand guy um who isn't credited with it was going to be Ralph Dodd's distiller. Now, Ralph funded the business, but then he did it under something called transferable shares, which at that time was like crowdfunding, but it was illegal. And he ended up getting talk, took to court by a guy called William Garrow, um, who, if you've ever seen the TV program, Garrow's Law, um, was a very famous barrister from the day. And he acted on behalf of the Crown and the whole business got shut down. So the mm. London Distillery of 18 whatever, never actually happened it got funded through crowdfunding yeah. had a location they bought the location and then it got shut down and it got shut down yeah. by the government um so it was like this weird twist of fate so so that's why we had dodd's gin and where uh-huh. this whole ralph dodd thing came from but we took this story to battersea power station you know this engineer entrepreneur creative guy who had built a distillery or was building a distillery on that location and, and they loved it. So we secured the site there. So what the plan was, was to leave whiskey production in Bermondsey and bring the gin production to Battersea. So we we're going to split the oh, business okay. yeah, yeah. Um, and have two locations. And then and then within that, the other plan was to come further down, midway between the Thames and have a rum distillery because we actually made rum as well. So yeah. so not a lot of people know London Distillery made the first rum in London. No, I've not tried um, any of rums. Yeah. So we, we did a small, small amount and put it down and, and yeah, I don't know what's happened to it. I know we gave some of it to the guys at White Lion um, or, or Lioness, you know, and Ryan Chetty and those guys. So they had it on the bar for a while. And yeah, yeah so we, we actually made a white rum as well. But so anyway, I, I, love, um, I love all the history. I mean, because I'm usually outside of this whiskey. I'm a, I'm a tour guide and, and of course I've got right. a lot of history. And so I, I, I love yeah. the kind of, I love the, the fine details of, that's why I was very interested in in the story of London Distillery Company, and I've kind of just yeah. let you, you know, the, the person who founded it, sort of tell me the story. And I kind of like all those connections yeah. with like the Dodds Gin, and which has been a very successful brand. And but um, yeah, when did things, you know? So I know there's been a bit of a so, turn yeah, in history. Sorry, 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 yeah, no, no, no. I, no, I, I, I I'm, I'm finding there. this very fascinating. Track, bring, bring and I was just going to move on to the um, <laughs> uh, to the whiskies and things. But um, yeah. when did all those kind of expansion plans and and think when did it sort of go a little bit uh you know so, when was the bump yeah. in the road <laughs> sorry i don't mean to talk over you there it's, um so so yeah the um so we we moved to bermondsey we get the site running again it took eight months to get the licenses for the bermondsey site to get production up and running again but yeah. you know the business had only just got into black and then we had to move yeah. So cash flow had became really crazy. We'd had to let the whole team go. At one point, I was the only member of staff in the business, and we were still shipping gin to Australia, China. You know, like we'd co-founded a Chinese distribution business in 2013, and and they were still selling products. So we were, you know, we had product going all over the world. Wow. Um, there's just me, and we 
bulked up on stock, but then, uh, you know, like I'm bottling, filling, trying to get all that stuff done. And the cash flow was just crazy, crazy tight. Um, so then um, we got our licenses back. Shareholders invested. So we went out to the shareholders rather than going to the market. They invested some monies in. Um, we brought a team back on board, started getting things running back as normal, you know, starting to get get back to normality. And I think over all of that, I just became hugely burnt out, you know, like I and I, I still hadn't dealt with the like the trauma of my partner and Ellie dying, you know, like we had yeah. two small children, all this stuff. Um moving the business like it was it was a it was a gong show you know like it was it was a if if anything like there was nothing else that could really go wrong um you know like we we'd been through the worst of it but the 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 key investors so the two of the the what were directors in the company said to me you know darren how how can we help you and i said to them well i, I think i would like to bring in a marketing manager um a marketing sales guy or you know i'd be open to someone else coming in and running the business but I, and i have a few people in mind so while i was exploring looking for marketing directors sales directors um and also potentially someone who could do my role and i would switch out and do the marketing and sales because that's kind of more where like the brand creative you know the sales i, I felt like that's where i could lead a bit better yeah. um and take some of the pressure off of me they brought they brought someone else to the fore um and we just didn't see things in the same way yeah. so i went through this process and this is 2017 at this point so i went through this process through the summer of 2017 where i'm traveling doing brand support and um and at the same time, trying to negotiate with the directors. I'll apologize you know, if you can hear a crying yeah. child in the background there. That's my, that's my son. <laughs> so, sorry, oh. I didn't mean to interrupt you. It's, it's all right. I'm wondering what that noise I, is. I, and that. <laughs> sorry to I interrupt you. Kids, so I'm, I'm totally used to it. Don't worry about <laughs> me. But um, yeah, so, so, the, um, so basically I go through the summer where I am in effectively a standoff with the the other management well two of the management team um it was kind of two abstained from the conversation and two two kind of were like we're not gonna we're, we're bringing this guy in to replace you there's no option you know like we are gonna replace you we want you to stay in the business but we're not going to tell you what your job is mm -hmm. until that person has taken over in december and you know there'd be like this transition period and i and I, I sort of said well that's not acceptable you know like the, the, there's legislation you know like there's government legislation in place if you're going to replace someone who's already in the business you need to offer them a job and you have to tell them what they're going to be compensated and we went through this whole back and forward and i said look the uncertainty is really killing me and i think you know i i don't know what the best option is and and this is at that point one of the other directors who'd kind of not got as involved in the conversation stepped in and said look darren why don't why don't we look at an option where you can either stay in the business as a consultant or i think you know you, you could you should just resign um you know because it, it's clear the relationship between you and your replacement isn't going to work yeah. So I, I took that advice and, and in the September board meeting we had, I said, look, I'm, I'm basically going to resign. I'm leaving the business. I don't think it makes sense for me to stay. Um, so at that point, they then asked me not to disclose that publicly um, because we'd just gone through a bit of a funding process. We were about to launch on Crowdcube again um, okay. to, to fundraise the Battersea project. And at the same time, we'd been talking to Berry Brothers and Rudd and, 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 you know, they were all ready to start doing an investment conversation. Well, they, they, we'd been through the investment conversation. They basically wanted to invest in the company and, and, and support the expansion because Berry Brothers obviously is on one side of the Thames, but they also have offices in Battersea. So for them, they could see the brand connection, you know, we, with the whiskey production. So like what you have there, we've been working with the Prince of Wales at the Dutchy Estate um, through Warminster Mountains. So we'd had Plumage Archer, which is the great, great grandmother of 
of like barley, like yeah. the modern barley varieties. Like Golden Promise is a mutation of it's a like when they did the old gamma ray superhero experiments on 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 plants. Um, yeah. They took they took Marisada, which is the daughter of, of Golden Promise. And uh, oh, sorry, the it, sorry Marisada is the daughter of Plumajacha, which was developed at Warminster by the woman, one of the Warminster um, leads sort of biologists back in the day. And, um, and, and Pluma Giorgio was actually used in the whiskey industry. At one point, it accounted for 80% of barley used in Scotch whiskey. Um, mm. So it's like heritage wise, it's like an amazing, amazing barley variety, it has this really nice richness and creaminess. Oh, and it was organic. So we, you know, we're doing all this stuff anyways, with the Prince of Wales and all these different people. And, and, um, and, uh, yeah it just i i resigned so just just to step back i resigned and um, because of the funding and they were talking to berry brothers at the time um they didn't want me to disclose that i was leaving because they felt it could impact all of that and i was more than happy to support and i went through the whole handoff period and when we got to the end i was literally in the last week of my my um, resignation period i was due to leave the week after christmas 2017 um mm. i was sitting down with our cfo and i highlighted some issues with some of the finances around around alcohol duty um and that there was some missing reports and and when he took that to the board they basically dismissed me okay so i had one week left in the business and i was dismissed okay, um, yeah. which you know it, it wasn't for me there was no love lost i was like okay fine but then yeah. then you know like they put a press release out saying i was dismissed for tax and this led to lawyers getting involved and a bunch of other stuff so then at that point i kind of can't really talk about much more but sure. you know what yeah. i can say is that london distillery and i have a document here that says that you know I'm basically not at fault um, mm -hmm. and that they accept that. Um, and, you know, there was some defamation bits that I'd, I'd, I'd seeked from them um, that so kind of got resolved. And I do want to interrupt you. So, so, it's, so it, it's quite an interesting situation now where we have, um, so anyone that, that doesn't know, then um, I guess the company continued on, you know, for a few years under a new management. Two more years. Yeah. Two more years. Um, yeah. And the whiskey that you'd laid down, the whiskey that you'd created, the whiskey that uh, you you pulled together all the ingredients and and you know yeah. sweated over yourself to produce. Um, that we're a situation now that the the, the British Honey Company um, have have the brand and have the whiskey and, and they've started to release it. And I must say thank you very much to uh, to the guys for sending me from the British Honey Company sending me two of the samples. But it must be a strange um, situation that the whiskey that you produced and made you know five yeah, six yeah. years ago is now to come to market um and perhaps you've not even tried some of them <laughs> that, you yeah. know i it's it's funny obviously i've sampled the new makes um yeah. and i think i i might still have some new make in my storage um like just little sample bottles that i'd taken home yeah. um yeah, I, I had a shareholder last year, an old shareholder in the original London Distillery last year email me um, and he said, hey, you know, like my my 109 cask, which were these like smaller casks that we had, um, they came from Kings County Distillery in New York and we filled them with the Pluma Jarcha spirit using the distiller's yeast with a mix of, um, with a mix of Young's. <clears throat> so the, the, no, it was a Whitbread, sorry. It was the original Whitbread B. And actually, when I'm saying about Young's having two yeast varieties, it was Whitbread, Whitbread B had two yeast varieties. Um, okay. So so we had, basically, we, we did a, a an initial fermentation with the Whitbread. So we took the Pluma Georgia, did the mashing process, you know, got the gravity up to, um, it was around eight, um, you know, the, for people who brew, they'll know what I'm talking about. And um, so we got the, the gravity a pretty decent, a decent level. And then we pitched in the the whip bread. After two days of fermentation, we then pitched the, the distiller's yeast. So we get a secondary fermentation. So the whip bread is bringing the, the sort of more ester profile, the heavy, like a really nice forward ferment, like ester forward fermentation. And then the distiller's yeast helps finish off the rest. But because it's an old 19... 20s distillers yeast 
it still yeah. has some ester profile. So then you get all this nice sweetness and everything. So yeah. So and Were then you... and then put that into bourbon casks. You know these small bourbon casks. I tried a little bit, um, and I was really impressed. I, I actually sat down with well, Joel, who had mentioned earlier, and tried. I'll move on to it. yeah to to I mean to the to the importance of the whiskey, and and that's the yeah. The interesting thing, so as I say, yeah, thanks to the, the British Honey Company who now own the brand for, for sending them out. Um, I've got the yep. the London Rye whiskey, um, oh, the well, LV seventeen sixty seven, yeah. um, yeah. and the one oh nine um, single malt. Yeah. I was actually going to save these to kind of sample now when you were with me, um, but the other day I opened them. I enjoyed them so much <laughs> that I, um, I, <laughs> I I continued to drink them. Um, so and I, I've got. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed them. Oh, very much so. And, and I don't know if um, how how my tasting notes um, are going to um, level up with what you had in the beginning, you know, like your ideas of yeah. how it, it could possibly turn out. But I, I have to put them here beside me because I've got a terrible memory. But okay. with the rye, um, yes. because on the nose, I, I had um, cola cube. Just to check, is the, yeah. is, is the rye in the English oak casks or is it in yes. American yeah, New English did it, did it New English version. Yeah, so that's the English oak. Perfect. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's the three-year-old English oak. So the plan with that was that we'd age the rye for, you know, two, three years yeah. and then pitch in another round of rye and then do our single malt whiskey. So the intention was always that we'd have the rye kind of do what bourbon would do uh -huh. and then and then we would follow that with the single malt whiskey so so there is a there is a single malt whiskey fill in one of the rye casks um somewhere. okay ah, that's interesting because yeah. yeah, i've got um with the the rye the uh, on the nose so i thought the nose was really nice on this like it's like cola cubes i, I kind of picked up dried orange peel yep um very yep. floral as well a bit of citrus yep. on the nose yeah um, i even had wet pavement you know when you're on a hot day and the kind of evaporation yeah. from a wet pavement quite a nice yeah sort of comforting smell um yeah and um what else? A, a little like a very herbal um kind of note like almost like ricola you know those ricola sweets um yeah that, that you get yeah it reminded yeah, me yeah. a little bit of root beer um, almost sorry Root beer almost. Yeah, kind kind of. It, it reminded me a little bit of um, uh, there's the Oxford Artisan Distillery. They've got some rise out as well, and there was there was some similarities. Yeah. And they also use um, English oak as well, and that must right. be a similar characteristic that that comes through. Yeah. So I did notice some similarities. Um, yeah. And then in the actually, I even put wax jacket as well. You know, there's wax jackets that you get. There was some. So it's yeah. actually pretty complex on the on the nose for the yeah. ride. Um, the, the wood character in the first six months yeah. was so like waxy, woody, you know, yeah. like the, and, and it, it's amazing, you know, you see that progression and I've spoken to people who make rye in other countries and, and there's this panic that you get as a, as a distiller when you first fill your casks, especially with rye and if it's new work that you get this like heavy wood character that, that yeah. you're like, oh geez, is it ruined? And the temptation is to pull it. But actually, yeah. as it ages, it, it it subdues and it becomes more complex and more cinnamon and clove yeah. and you know like yeah. those it's those kind of characters. I've, and, I, and I've put in my on the palette there. I put that um, I kind of really liked how it behaves on the palette. That it reminded me that as of the first time, and, and, and I think this is a great comment. The first time I tried Pappy Van Winkle, where it kind of it's very central right. and then kind of melts. If you know what I mean. Yeah, I don't yeah, know if yeah. you're a fan yeah. of. I'm going to take, but... take that as a compliment. I'm yeah, take that as well, a compliment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it kind of went, went very central in the palate, and then just kind of dissolves on the tongue. And I, and I kind yeah. of, I kind of like the the feel of that. Um, nice. And um, then I put it, initially the finish was very warm and woody, and then things go to a sort of spicy citrus, um, and then yep. it kind of sits at the front of the mouth, which was quite a Moorish yeah. that you want to go back again. So I, I thoroughly enjoyed the yeah. rye. I think it's um, brilliant. I mean the. I know it's, it's it's out for sale at the moment. It's it's a pretty hefty yeah. price tag, but I guess if you take into consideration, you know, this is the first London rye whiskey. This is aged in oak casks that were made by Alistair Sims. There's not much of it. Yeah. It's then you can kind of see, yeah. you know, where, where yeah. it's pitched at price wise. It's, but, it's an it's an investment piece. I think. I think. Yeah. I, I feel like that's that's where they've kind of came into the market. And I know the the previous management of London Distillery, who you know, they brought it into the administration. Mm. Um, they they'd priced a bottle earlier at that level as well. 
And I think, you know, it, at the end of the day, there's, there's a very limited quantity. You know, I think when we were talking earlier, I was saying, you know, from a brand strategy point of view with the remaining casks, personally, I, I would just stick them in the warehouse and watch them and check that they're not aging too far. But the, it's mm -hmm. almost, and, and this isn't, hopefully this doesn't seem like vanity on my part. It's almost like a Kurosawa style situation where you've got a distillery that was open that, you know, had a lot of promise and then it's, it's gone um at least in its original form it's gone so yeah. now you know you have these very rare limited casks that you know let them age let them go where they go and and, and, and see what you get and i think i think they've kind of tapped into that maybe investment piece but it's very young liquid yeah um, and, but like you say it's tasty liquid and i've got the, the 109 single malt as well which i think is the one that you've, you've yep. tried with your friend um yeah i was i was very impressed with this i thought this was this is one of the nicest uh, English whiskies I've tried, um, you. you know, this year. I think I think it's it's really good. I'm not just saying that because because you're here. Yeah. I think I, I mentioned to you earlier that um, again my my notes are on here somewhere. Um, where did I put it? Just because I'm terrible. I, I kind of signed it off it with bloody love this. Um, so that, that kind of <laughs> when I flick through my my book, it means that okay, I need to go back and look at this one because I really enjoyed it. But yeah, um, if I flick back through this, my notes on that one. Um, I've got on the nose, lovely light um, and fresh nose, sweet custard cream biscuits, lemongrass, honey, yeah. um, all the kind of things that I picked up. Um, and then, so it's very, very delicate and very kind of floral, which I really liked. But then yeah. um, the gentle and alluring nose gives way to a much more powerful sensation as it hits the mouth. Those custard cream biscuits are still there. The honey are, is too, but all wrapped yeah. up in wood. Um, and then these notes continue on the finish and there is much more bourbon wood influence vanilla comes through so I thought it was a very very complex very well balanced um, it was approachable for, for many people but for those that yeah. want to go deeper into the complexity it, it kind of ticked all those boxes so I think it's a, a yeah, pretty yeah, stunning yeah. single malt that one yeah, and I think some some of that, you know, the the aging profile, because I, I I feel like that it could go a lot longer, you know, the the mm. and a lot of that comes down to yes, there's yeast and the fermentation process, and you know, like there's micro oxygenation you can use to speed things up and all. There's a ton yeah. of different techniques that you see in the whiskey distillery. The late Jim Swan, we had consult on some bits. Yeah. Um, but you know, when it comes down to wood. Um, it's so important to try and get that right. And we were using Buffalo Trace um, barrels, um, okay. the ASBs, and they, they were a minimum of six to seven years aged bourbon. So, so with that, you get really good extraction of a lot of the tannins and some of the heavier flavors. So, yeah. you know, you'd get, you'd, you, when you get the wood, and, and this is where I could geek out a little bit because I, I actually um, I studied trees. I went to university and studied arboriculture. So we got into cellulose, hemi hemicellulose, you know, lignin, like wow. the wood structure. And when you let wood break down and when you do the extractive processes, you know, and the, especially with charring and different bits, you get you get a lot more different flavor profiles coming through. So the, 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 the casks and the liquid design were made so that they could age up to 15 plus years um so you know like it would be amazing to see you know that liquid in in a bigger barrel setting rather than an american standard you know oh, or, well, you know with the, the the little 109s if you went up to the american standards they're going to sure. go away and longer. that's one thing i'm hoping to do i'm hoping to keep in touch with yeah. you know the british honey company find out what their yeah. plans are and i'm sure there are a few kind of cask owners yeah. and things like that that still have some yeah. so it would be i don't know if in the future there's going to be some independent bottlings from those and people push things fingers crossed. yeah <laughs> i'd say the yeah. same fingers and, crossed you know it's yeah yeah now, I, i'm, I'm, I'm sad to... i would love to try I, you know i haven't had any samples so you know like the team at british honey company if you ever want my feedback or even just info on what type of barley like you know the barley as same plumage archer it grew at the edge of the lawn of high grove so yeah. it's literally like high grove house here the lawn and the plumage archer was there uh -huh. um, and the day i visited we actually saw the prince of wales like in a bush he was he was doing some hedging so he was like his <laughs> boots were st sticking out Fantastic. of the hedge and David David the head farmer who took us around that day like for the, and it's actually the barley that's in your drink um that was grown on or the, oh. the samples that you had there the juice you have um, I, I didn't that, know any of was, this I didn't yeah. know any of this until you, you mentioned it and can you imagine yeah. I mean 
of course, we know Prince Charles' love of you know, certainly Laphroaig and, and that being yeah. the only whiskey with the kind of Prince of Wales yeah. feathers. You know, who knows? He gets a sample of, um, yeah, or a few yeah, samples yeah. of... Totally. Uh, they should, they um, should send him a sample. Guys absolutely. at British Honey Company, if you watch this, send the Prince of Wales samples of the whiskey because it's his barley yeah. that the whiskey's made with. Um, seriously yeah it's and nice. it's heritage it's all it's all organic as well it you know and the, the soil certificates soil associations and association certificates were there um when when we made it so so you know if they, if you were really inclined to do the organic certification even the rise organic as well mm -hmm. it's it, it was all all there and met the standards Incredible. Well, now, now, Darren, I don't want to cut you short, but the thing is, um, see, no, I've got one of those Zoom right. accounts that's probably going to cut me off because I haven't paid the premium subscription. So um, I'll probably yeah. get, I don't want to cut And we've been talking for an hour again. <laughs> well, it's fantastic. And, um, uh, one one last thing, though, I, I will, um, uh, just, I just wanted to, you know, just, just so now, like, what are you doing? What What's uh, since London Distillery Company and, and you parting with with that? What's What's been happening for you and uh, what your future plans and? So when I, when I left London Distillery, I got involved, I'd, I'd already been, we'd been looking to grow the Dodds brand globally. So I'd made lots of contacts with people overseas and one, one of those was in Brazil. So I ended up starting a Brazilian um, drinks brand with a guy called Andre and, and that's actually grown to be quite big in Brazil. So it's going really well down there. And I, last year I spent, I actually spent a big chunk of the year foraging all over Brazil and the Amazon and mm -hmm. the Pantanal and all these different areas around Brazil and mid -gen down there. But we've got plans to launch a rum. Um, okay. So I've been working on that. I, I'm actually, I've got, I, I'm working on one last kind of gin project and then I'm never doing gin again. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I always started out wanting to do whiskey and be known for whiskey, but as distillery projects go, you need to finance them. So gin and vodka are very quick for cash flow. Um, I've been, I'm back in England at the moment. My fam, my kids are in Canada. So I split my time between Canada and the UK, but um, I have um, been approached about a couple of projects here and it's just trying to find the right one. I definitely want to get some sort of fermentation British thing going, you know, am I too late to do English whiskey? Maybe not and do it in the, the original guys Maybe that I, I wanted to do yeah. it in. I, I guess, it's just so guess expensive. I <laughs> see, I'd love to do that. I'd love to go to different distilleries and do guest spots and get Chris from Sure Brew to knock me some yeast up and, you know, sauce some barley and all that stuff. If any anyone out there who sees this wants a guest distilling spot, um, I'm in the UK and I'm always willing to come and have some fun and spend a couple of days. Um, well, judging, something uh, as a foot, I, I know right. you've got to cut it off, but you know, as a footnote, and this is also going back to the whiskey casks that British Honey Company now owns. Um, you know, when, when you are making whiskey, the first four distillations, you're trying to balance the system. So whenever we did a barley or a yeast variety, you have to do at least four, because we had a fermentation size match to us still, you have to do four different fermentations and then you recycle the low wines and the heads to get you to the balance point of knowing what that liquid is like. So actually some of the, the casks that British Honey Company has have, um, have a kind of in, imbalanced liquid that leads to the balanced liquid yeah. so actually being able to see that as those liquids age and come out that'll be interesting to see but um the plume majority you've got from the final balanced liquid now if anyone wants to do a collaboration i know it means getting a final whiskey product properly probably is is like four or five fermentations happy to come for a couple of weeks and do do some fermentation. Well, Sorry, I mean, that was an aside. No, no, no. I was just saying, judging, <laughs> <Shameless by, plug. laughs> judging by what I've tried, uh, and I, I've also should say I've got um, one of your. I tried your new make spirit um, from a test right. bed series, and I think it's yeah, the one yeah, that's yeah. been aged maybe six months. Um, and See, we didn't even get into the rye liquid production. That's a whole. Okay, other well, story. we'll have to do another part too. But um, yeah. I, yeah. Uh, from what I've tried, I've been really impressed and. I think it should also be appreciated that you know really in london you and your your partner that set up the uh, london still company you guys really pioneered whiskey making in london and um you know all the innovations yeah. that are happening now a lot of that kind of started off from you guys and and um so i think that should be really appreciated and and so the quality of the spirit that i've tasted is, is excellent so uh, yeah if there's any distilleries watching you, you, you go out there doing a collaboration. I think that would be a, like the, the Rook series or something. You know, <laughs> Thanks, Richard. <laughs> if I had a distillery, I'd get, you know, maybe I've got a little tiny thing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah, 
you know, like I, I'd love to do another chat with you. Maybe we can just talk about English whiskey generally once uh, I get well, going. Well, I or we can talk I, about the rye. Yeah. Absolutely, I've got a few um, whiskeys that I think that are coming soon. So perhaps uh, I hope that I'd like to start doing things in person again. You know, when we can, but um, yeah. in it might be Zoom kind of things for a while. But uh, maybe yeah. we can do a tasting. You know, get some things sent over to yeah. you. I'll get another some, someone else um, that I'm involved with, one of the yeah. other kind of guys that do some of the things that I do. Maybe we do a bit yeah, of a tasting, yeah, yeah. see what you think of some, some English whiskeys. I'd, I'd, I'd be up for it. You know, I'm, I'm now, I'm, I'm not biased because I, I, I'm not a, I'm not involved in any of those distilleries. So if you ever want a little <laughs> feedback or a discussion, I'm always That's happy fantastic. to do it. Well, I better go Amazing. before I get cut off from Zoom. Yes. Yeah, so I've, yeah, I've got yeah, the basic yeah. no, subscription. Thank you for your time. Off, but, but Darren, thank yeah. you so much for um, this chat. I really appreciate it. And, and I've learned so Great. much. And I think we initially thought, yeah, we'll just do a 10 minute, 10, 15 minute video. But we've been speaking <laughs> to each other for like two hours now. So it's, uh, it's great. <laughs> and I really.